Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. In alhamdulillahi ta'ala, nahmaduhu wa nasta'inuhu wa nasta'ahu. Wa na'udhu billahi min shururi anfusina wa min sayyati amalina. Wa min yahdihillahu falamudhillah, wa min yudhul falahadiyillah. Wa ashadu an la ilaha illallah, wa akhdahu la sharikallah. Wa ashadu anna muhammadan abduhu rasuluh. يا أيها الذين آمنوا تقوا الله يكفر كتبه ولا تموتون إلا وأنتم مسلمون. Indeed, all praise is due to Allah. We praise Him. We seek refuge with Allah from the evil in our soul and from our sinful deeds. Those who are guided by Allah subhanahu wa taala, no one can misguide them. Those who are not guided by Allah, there is no guide for them. I bear witness that there is no deity worthy of worship except Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is his servant and messenger. O you who believe, revere Allah as he should be revered and I not except as Muslims. I'm about to proceed. I'd like to welcome you this morning. I don't know where everybody is, but alhamdulillah. Inshallah, they're running on Muslim Standard Time or they're in Daytona. Um, <laughs> something, I don't know. <laughs> uh, a lot was going on. Maybe people exhausted themselves at the carnival yesterday. I don't know. Um, but Bassam is here, and I know he worked hard, and they soon is here, and she worked hard, and she's done. Alhamdulillah. Um, where few are gathered, the law is always among us, and where his name is mentioned, he mentions us in a better gathering. So I hope you that. Um, I want to remind you that in lieu of the February potluck, the faith club will be at the United Church of Christ at 4 o'clock. Um, that is next Saturday. If there's any way you can come, please come. Please show up. Please show your face. Um, it's a great opportunity for people to see you. Uh, to see Muslims, to interact with Muslims, to talk to Muslims, dialogue, and get their questions answered. Do you know who's coming? How many are planning to come? Four people. Okay, completely not here. If there's any way that you can come, um, please try to come. Um, of course, we still collect these items. I'm not going to go over it again. If you want to be on the group, contact me soon. Walk a mile in her shoes, March the 3rd, from 5 to 7. It starts at the Orange County Courthouse. Um, we would like you to go on and register. Um, the website is the Harbor House, and then the Walk a Mile in Her Shoes, if you want to look. It is $25. It's a very good cause. Um, $25 goes a long way in a domestic violence shelter. So, um, a lot of the men will be wearing high heel shoes, uh, symbolically of um, walking a mile in her shoes. You don't have to worry that a man will not be wearing high heel shoes. I will put you pieces everywhere. But um, obviously, the idea is simply to um, symbolically walk in her shoes, the shoes of someone who's battered. Um, I'm walking in men's shoes because there are also men that are battered and we're trying to heighten the consciousness of that as well. Um, so I think it should be walking their shoes. But anyway, please, how many people will be able to do this? Will anybody be able to join us? Mashallah, three. It is March the 3rd, Thursday, March the 3rd, um, and you have to be downtown. Um, it's on the board, 5 to 7, Orange County, Fort Apple. Right, okay. And I guess and please register in advance um, when you go on to register. If you have any trouble with this, just call me soon. She'll tell you how to register. Um, please register in advance um, if you would. It's a really important piece of the vision of ISLEM to address domestic violence. And when we started this organization, one of our major donors begged us, please don't be involved in uh, domestic violence. And we've done it, and we've made a difference, and we will continue to do that despite the fact that it has um, sometimes affected our popularity. So um, the Islamic Peace Rally, March the 5th at Lake Yola, um, we'll post that. I think it's already been posted, right, Mason, the time? Yeah, yes. Okay. So as many people as possible, please attend that. Um, I think that was being organized predominantly by uh, American... AMC, right? I, I think so. 
history. It just um, Dr. Kazi. The Muslim Academy of Greater Orlando's barbecue, if you can support that on March the 19th, 1 to 6, tickets are $10. Please see Sharon. Um, we have free rent here, which is amazing. Um, and I'd like to support the school as much as possible, inshallah. And we also have tickets for the Muslim Women's Organization right there. Oh, okay. There's a gala on March 12th. It's open to men and women. So you can register online uh, if you want to purchase a ticket, or if you don't feel comfortable doing it online, I can um, help you with that. Did everybody hear that? Okay. Um, I'm not sure that. Yeah, okay. So here are, is the information about this, the gala. It's a very nice gala. And um, Linda Sassour, who is speaking, is an amazing speaker. She's a true activist. As a matter of fact, she is sometimes referred to as the Muslim Rosa Parks. Um, she's quite an amazing lady. I think you would enjoy hearing her speak. So um, that's it for the exam for the examples uh, uh, for the announcements. Uh, I've been mixing words up all day. I'm not quite sure what it's all about. In terms of no, thank you, but thank you anyway. In terms of what's been going on, um, uh, Sister Ran has obviously had rehearsal. Um, we are working still with St. Timothy's Catholic Community in Leesburg. We are planning in April a peace prayer service where there will be a, a spiritual leader from the Jewish community, a Christian minister, a pastor Drew Willard from the United Church of Christ and myself. We will have a part in this service um, if there's any way you can make that. Uh, April the 7th from 2 to 3.30 in the villages. Just keep that in mind, St. Timothy's Catholic community. So we are picking up today um, in Surah 2, verses 178 and 179, where we will look at the sanctity of life. That's how I would like to sort of title this part. In the second part of today's class, we will look at inheritance. And um, how many people know what abrogation means? Okay, we have one person, so that means I need to say what it means. We will look at a a uh, particular surah in the Quran that was abrogated. And an abrogation means that it would appear to you, perhaps as a new student, that there's a contradiction. For example, somebody, uh, one time a convert came to me and he said, well, I don't understand why, um, why you can't drink as a Muslim because it just says don't go to your prayers before. So I can have a drink, but as long as I'm not drunk, I can pray. <laughs> and I started chuckling because well, obviously what he said made sense. And I said, well, there was an abrogation. There was a verse that came later that said, no more drinking. So abrogation is a, a, an evolution or an elevation in spirituality because if you look at um, Islam when they went from Mecca to Medina, and this is, by the way, to answer Warren's question last week, I wanted to be sure before I answered it. Some chapters in the Holy Quran are both Mecca and Medini. Um, in that some of the verses were revealed in Mecca and some of the verses were revealed in Medina. Now, what is the difference predominantly in Mecca and Medina surahs? Does anybody know? Meccan surahs are the Tawhi and uh, Medina is the law. Yes. Remember that when they migrated to Medina they were establishing the first Islamic state. So therefore, there's a lot about legislation. There's a lot about Tawheed addressing the pagans in the Meccan surahs, but in the Medinan surahs, you find a lot of stuff about legislation. So when you see an abrogation, what does that tell you? Medinan. It's typically going to be a, a Medinan uh, address. Okay? So, alhamdulillah. So, so, okay, so where was the... The... the Surah al-Baqarah has verses from both, according to the majority of the scholars. Today we will be looking at some verses peculiar, Pacific, I'm sorry, to uh, Medina, because they're about legislation. For example, the laws of inheritance. When did those laws come into being? As a matter of fact, the abrogation about the laws of inheritance actually has to do with um, what was pre-Mecca and what was post-Medina. And we'll, we'll talk about that, and I think you'll see it as we talk about that and sort of as it unfolds. But in terms of the law of equality, in Surah 2, uh, or Qasas, 
Surah 2 of Baqarah 178, 179. O you who believe, al qisas the law of equality, is prescribed for you in case of murder. The free for the free, the slave for the slave, and the female for the female. Now before I go further, what do you see in that first sentence? Equality. Equality, very good, Noreen. You're getting bonus points today, mashallah. <laughs> You're on top of the game today. Okay. What else do you see besides equality? Equality of what? Well, um, freedom, and slavery, but what about it? Let, look at the verse. Oh, you who believe, oh, kasas, the law of equality is prescribed for you in case of murder. The free for the free, the slave for the slave, and the female for the female. So in other words, this verse begins by pointing out the value of a female is the same as that of a, as a male. The value of a slave is the same as that as a free person in Islam. So that status, and if you look at, for example, the Indian culture before Islam, it was a caste system and still to this day still exists to some extent. Um, is a caste system based on this verse? No, no, it isn't. Because there's no equality in the caste system. If you're a part of a certain caste, then you can't marry below your caste. Now, obviously, the, the context here shifts a little bit, and it talks about murder. And this is something amazing in terms of Dawa to look at in terms of what this verse means relative to today particularly relative to what we're going through in the world today in terms of our criticisms. So, but if the killer is forgiven by the brother or the relatives of the killed against uh, blood money, then it should be sought in a good manner and paid to him respectfully. So this kisos is about the law of equality, regardless. Now then, there is an introduction here to blood money. Islam was the first religion that actually clarified that you could accept blood money. And we're going to look at what this is really all about, what the, what the core of blood money is about, which is very phenomenal. And I'll leave that carrot dangling out there for a while. And so basically it's saying, you know, if you kill one of my children or my brother or something and I say okay instead of you being killed because eye for an eye, tooth for tooth, you'll see it later as I unfold this give me some money and the money is stipulated obviously in the fit as to how much it is and I'll show you that later then Allah says that's a mercy so pay it quickly because you're being given life. You've taken a life, but you're being given a life. Now, just in that thinking right there, if you can think out of the box, how dichotomous is that to what the news says about Islam? How dichotomous is that to the idea of terrorism? That actually Allah has prescribed that if I am at that station, that maqam spiritually, that I can let you pay me blood money instead of you losing your life. That's very juxtaposed to the sort of ideology of terrorism. So after this, whoever transgresses the limits, that is, kills the killer. So here's what he's saying. Okay, so you killed my brother, and I said, okay, give me the blood money. I got my blood money, but then I go murder you. This is what this is saying. I'm giving you the, the good news for modern men version. He shall have a painful torment. And there is a saving of life for you in al qisas the law of equality and punishment. O men of understanding that you may acquire taqwa. So there is an illusion, not an illusion, it is being alluded to that people who are able to forgive 
have taqwa. The people that can exercise this are people of taqwa. They are people of elevated faith. Um, 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 so if you give money, mm -hmm. that would be as a form of forgiveness? Yes. But if you're going to forgive, you don't need money to forgive. Well, the thing is, the law at that time, and this is an abrogated verse. What you've got to understand in context, Sharon, is that the law of that time was if you murdered someone, you got murdered. No questions about last. So a law came along and said, life is, is, there's a sanctity to life. There's a preciousness to life. So if you can, if your demand is developed, what you can do to that person is say, give me blood money, and you won't have your life will be taken. So is that like saying, like, if somebody murders somebody and goes to jail and there's being sentenced to, um, sentenced to be, you know, be killed, you know, um, capital punishment, that instead of getting being killed, if you got money, that would just, if, if you, you know, if you gave money. That's exactly what it is, except that under this ordinance from a law, you see, people sit in jail for years. I wish Yassin was here today. Uh, people sit in jail for sometimes years before they are tried. This is a very quick, this is, this is another way that life is respected in Islam. It's done very quickly. So you know what? We don't want to take a life because life is sacred. So if you pay us, and I'll show you later on what the fig amount is, but I've just tried to unfold it for you. If you pay us, we will forgive you. Now, that doesn't mean that Allah forgives you. And there's another principle here because a lot of Muslims erroneously believe that only Allah forgives and we don't forgive. So a lot of times I've seen people go and say, would you please forgive me for what I said? And they say, I can't forgive you. You've got to talk to Allah. Well, you're going to see today, by the time I'm finished, you will see that they are clearly an error. Their thinking is erroneous. Their cognitions are flawed. Yes, brother. I know that they still do this. Absolutely. Time, they still, yes. Not just for murder, for even if somebody got into a fight and hurt somebody, they'll, I forgot the term, there's an Arabic term that they, but they'll come and they'll agree to them, maybe a, a money value. Like they will forgive them. Well, no, it's not, because you're saving a life. Otherwise, that, another person is going to be killed. Saying life is more important. So life is more important is the way I see it. Um, let's look at some more verses so that we don't get this stuck on the first one. But I think this is an unfold. You may see it a little differently. I'll be curious yeah. to, to see if you do. So why do you think slaves and females are among the first things mentioned in this verse prescribing the law of equality to believers? Because at the time... You know, one person had buried 11 of their daughters alive. There was a son preference in the society. And we still have it today. As a matter of fact, the way I see this verse is sort of like this was the first Black Lives Matter campaign. Except instead of it just being black lives, it was slaves and women. How many people know about the Black Lives Matter campaign? Good. It's a major problem and it's interesting that I hope, I was listening to Bernie Sanders uh, giving a speech and his speech was right on in terms of statistics. But whether they will do anything if they get in office is another thing. But when we look at the Trayvon Brown's and the other situations, uh, Trayvon Martin, I'm sorry, um, these situations that have happened, it is very clear, and we look at the number of African Americans that are incarcerated in comparison to Caucasian people, you can clearly see that there is systemic racism in this country, and no question about it. In a society where slaves and females were systemically and intentionally targeted for demise, Allah mentions mercy in this verse. This is a verse about freedom, justice, and mercy. This is a verse about restoration, restoring life, and the importance of life. 
And you know, when I was reading this verse and when I was pondering and reflecting over it, it just showed me again, it shows me again and again how far ahead of mankind in general the Prophet Muhammad was. Um, you know, we would call this today genius. But that these things were being addressed, obviously the, the revelation was coming from Allah. But the Prophet Muhammad ﷺ was implementing this. He was making it the law of the land. That everybody matters. Whether you're a slave or whether you're a woman, everybody matters. The law of equality. We know that Islam is a religion of mercy and that the Prophet Muhammad ﷺ came as a mercy to mankind. And we, the learning in that for us is that we want to be merciful and forgiving people. It is so important. Look at these verses. How merciful would it be if somebody took the life of one of my children for me to be able to say, you know what, I don't want your life to be taken. Because the life is of the sanctity of life. My religion teaches that life is so special. I don't want your life to be taken. I'm just going to throw out a number for the sake of understanding. So give me a hundred thousand dollars. I don't want you to be killed. Imagine the reputation that Muslims would have if we implemented this verse. Do you know how many parents would come up with that money to free their child that was a murderer? Now I know that this probably is a little touchy for some people. But even I see this verse as a great deterrent. If you know that Allah has said, a life for a life, now this can happen, but what's the chances? We know that today, how many really, I mean, I just want to, to dialogue a little bit. How many people would implement this today that you know? I would. Okay. But do you think the majority would? No. Can I exactly. ask Yes. So what if you what if you want to do that but you don't have the money to do it? There's people that have more money than others, so then they they lose out while the others don't. Then you can't do it. <laughs> I mean, so if you can't. Not, then to me, if only if it only works for certain people, then. Well, I think it's interesting. I, I will get to you, brothers, in the order of your hand. I think it's interesting that the law mentions slaves and women. And if we look at the context of history at that time, slaves and women were very, very oppressed. They're oppressed today. But at that time, they were super oppressed. It must have meant that somehow they were able to raise money. Now, we look at oppression. I would love to have the stats on how many of these murders were women and slaves. Because it's more likely that a person would murder a woman and a slave than the other way around. Because they saw them as less than. Uh, yes, brother, and then Bassett. Uh, I think, well, what, what I'm thinking is, I have the same viewpoint as the sister because um, it's like who does most of the murder? Because as far as I, my research is that the murder is done in this country is institutionalized because I mean if it's, it seems like it's more of a deterrent for the poor instead of the wealthy because who brings drugs in this community who goes off and fights these foreign wars who does that not the poor but the wealthy and that's 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 my same to the point of the system well um I think you're making some great points, very valid points. And I think as it unfolds, it'll be interesting to see how you, if your feelings change as we look at other verses. Bassam. In cases that I've heard of this being used today, usually they go as a, a whole family would go, not just like a parent and his and their sibling and their children. It's kind of like their whole family. So they're all going together and kind of raising the money together. So if I don't have the money, they like their uncles, their friends, they're all kind of helping out with that. And 
what they're doing is kind of protecting their child or whoever it is from being hurt, really is what it's for. And it's interesting because when we look at the, the Trayvon Martins and the situations that we've seen in the world, look at the community, how they raised the money to help the um, legal funds of these young men. So to me, it's a way that people can come together and it's equality, increased equality for the marginalized people. Yes, brother. Also, the in cases that I've heard, I have an uncle overseas that is really, he's like the elder in the community. Right. And he's involved in stuff like this a lot. And if they don't sit down and do this, a lot of times a lot of people get hurt in the aftermath just trying to get back at the other people for what they did to them or stuff like that. So. I think there's a deeper piece to this as well because back in the I think there's a deeper piece in I think there's a deeper piece in this in that if you look at tribal warfare prior to this revelation, what do we know about that? What do we know about tribal warfare? Blood They fought until the very last member of one of the tribes was dead. So it was a bloody mess in the literal sense of the world. I'm not trying to be funny here. So this revelation, if you look at it in the context of the time that it came, was phenomenal. Changing people's cognitions, their mind about the sanctity of life, the sanctity of women, that slaves should be freed, that people should not be oppressed. And it's interesting that in al qabeya the science of the great sins, one of the greatest sins in Islam is oppression. In Surah Al-Ma'idah, Surah 5 and verse 32, On that account we ordain for the children of Israel that if anyone slew a person, unless it be for murder or for spreading mischief in the land, it would be as if he slew the whole people. And that's 7.4 billion people today. And if he saved, if, if anyone saved a life, it would be as if he saved the life of the whole people. Then although there came to them our apostles with clear signs, yet even after that, many of them continued to commit excesses in the land. So here we see, and we're going to see more verses, where the sanctity of life is talked about. I want you to take a picture of every one of these verses with your iPhone, because when you're making dawah out there and people are saying Muslims are terrorists and Muslims take people's lives, you're going to go to this verse and say, no, we were the first religion that created the law of equality. We were the first religion that said that you could pay blood money. Our religion said that if you take a life, unless it's for treason or murder, that it's like taking all of mankind, which is 7.4 billion people. Let's look at another verse. Well, we, let's talk about it first. Previously, we looked at the nature of righteousness. Now the text enters into the description of related subsidiary injunctions. Irrespective of the gender or status of the parties, this verse addresses righteousness, even or equal retaliation, kisos, or forgiveness regardless of gender or social status. The offense is not forgiven, but if the aggrieved party relents and is willing to forgive the kisos, the equal retaliation, the killer will pay diya, which is the Arabic word for blood money. The law of blood money and pardon is a mercy from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Islam was the first religion prescribing the possibility of blood money. This is such vital information to have folks when you're doing da'wah. Because the majority of the people out there believe that we don't value life. The Bible phrase, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth, was the prescribed punishment for crimes committed by one person against another. Prior to the Old Testament law, punishment for crime was usually much more severe than the crime itself. In Surah al shura 42 and verse 40, the recompense for an injury is an injury equal thereto in degree. But if a person forgives, who does it say forgives? A person. A person. So does that not contradict the idea of many Muslims who say, I can't forgive you? 
and makes reconciliation, his reward is due from Allah. For Allah loveth not those who do wrong. So who is the one that does wrong in this verse? The one who doesn't forgive. The one who doesn't honor this law of equality. The one who doesn't realize and materialize the sanctity of life. Yes, sorry. Did somebody raise it? I'm sorry, Brother Mike. I just want to, um, as far as forgiveness, um, I think I told you about my situation. How people, uh, family members can hate you because yes. of a certain thing. It's, it's hard to forgive when you've constantly been bombarded for years because you want to, you love, you love a lot because of what you know, not because of what they don't want to know. I mean, but it's, it's mentally it's hard to train yourself to forgive. I guess you have, I guess I need to keep seeking counseling for that. I, I believe you're right there, brother, because as we evolve spiritually and we recognize that the mercy that Allah has meted out to us, just calling us to Islam. I mean, we were on the brink of hellfire. I can tell you that I was on the brink of hellfire. I left Christianity believing that there was one God and became a humanist. Because I was addicted to helping people. And I had to find a way. I couldn't stop serving people. I'd served people all my life. And you know what my teacher said to me one day? He said, when are you going to rise up and say that you're God? And that, that is the final step of being a humanist, is that you've got to say that you're the God of your experience. And that's when I left humanism. <laughs> because I said, I can now never be able to do that. Because a humanist will tell you, you're the master of your destiny. You're the captain of your ship. You determine your fate. Which is contrary to what Allah says. Yes, Allah has given us a lot of freedom of will, but we don't determine our fate. In Surah 64 and verse 14, O you who believe truly among your wives and your children are some that are enemies to yourself, so be aware of them. But if you forgive and overlook and cover up their faults, Verily, Allah is all forgiving, most merciful. So whenever you're doing da'wah, you say, you know, the prescription to the Muslim is to forgive and overlook the faults. The Prophet was a mercy to mankind. We want to be a mercy to Orlando, a mercy to Dr. Phillips, a mercy to Winter Park, a mercy to St. Cloud, a mercy to Metro West, wherever you live. And look how merciful it would be if someone took your family member and you were willing to say, give me the blood money. I don't want your life to be taken. In Surah Al-Imran, Surah 3, verse 134, those who spend freely, whether in prosperity or in adversity, who restrain anger and pardon all, for Allah loves those who do good. So can men pardon? Yes. I often have heard this. I have gone to somebody and say, please forgive me. Oh, no, 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 brother. The only one that can forgive is Allah. There's something wrong with the aqidah of that person. There's something wrong with the understanding of that person. While the Quran does say revenge is an option, the best practice is forgiveness. It's a better option. In Surah Fusilat 41 and 34, nor can goodness and evil be equal. Repel evil with what is better. Then will be between whom and thee was hatred become as if it were by friend and intimate. Thy friend and intimate. There's a, a story that I'm sort of ashamed of, but When we moved to North Carolina, we were waiting for a three-bedroom apartment. We had three kids at the time. We weren't waiting for the fourth one at, for, at then, right, Norman? No, that, that... Oh, we were. Okay. So, we were all piled up in a two-bedroom apartment, 
And the, the apartment manager kept saying, this apartment will be available such and such a day. Well, we would go by there, and they'd put new carpet in there, and they really cleaned it up because they knew we, you know, we wanted a no-smoking place, a place that was clean. And then these people that were fixing the apartment would be having a party in there. So one day I walked over there and there was two women rolling around in the grass, I mean pounding each other. And I thought, oh my God, what is this? And it was a mother-in-law and her mother, a mother-in-law and her daughter-in-law, sorry. Well, as I'm witnessing this, I realized that they're going to be my neighbor. <laughs> And this was going to be a test for me. At first, I had learned these verses. And I wasn't very warm toward them. I thought I was better than they were because I would never think of rolling down around in the dirt and fighting with somebody. So, of course, I thought I was arrogant and superior. But as those people live by us, they begin to love us. And we begin to soften toward them. And they moved. And they had a, a little child. How old was she, Diane? Five. That was five years old. And the father was letting the teenager, she was actually just turned 12, I believe, drive the car. They stopped at the mailbox to get the mail. And the teenager hit the gas too hard. The five-year-old came out and was killed instantly. And what the family said was that the first time that the father had been able to talk to anyone or let go was when I came and he just fell on me. This is a Christian, Pentecostal Christian family and a Muslim imam. So Allah can take your enemy and if you are kind and merciful to them and make them your bosom friend. 